Hey everyone, this is Kai Wehner from Confluent. Today I want to talk about Apache Kafka versus traditional middleware. So if you know tools like a message queue on ETL and ESB, or in the meantime, we are also talking about IPaaS integration platform as a service, then this talk is for you to learn about the differences and when to use which one. In the end, this is an update of what I did a few years ago, comparing Kafka with legacy middleware, I would say. Today, we also include IPaaS, so the more cloud-native middleware. And also, I will talk about different Kafka offerings you can use and how they differ from each other. So with that, let's get started. First of all, I think in the meantime, most people agree that Apache Kafka is used everywhere as de facto standard for messaging at scale, true decoupling of microservices, a lot of continuous data processing in real time. And also in the meantime, as a backbone for data mesh to truly decouple the different data products. Even so many of the data products then can be something like a data warehouse or an analytics engine. However, still, while the recording now is in 2022, we are still discussing, should you use Apache Kafka as middleware? And I can tell you so many enterprises do because of the benefits compared to traditional middleware. So with this motivation, let's take a look at the agenda for the next minutes. We will talk about traditional middleware and what it is and compare it to data streaming platforms like Kafka. And then we will talk about how they fit to each other, when to use which one and about the pros and cons. Let's get started with the traditional middleware. Well, if you know something like this slide from any of your favorite middleware tools that you used in the last decades, it's always the same. So the marketing slide is like you have a black box in the middle and it does all the beauty stuff for you. So it does the data integration, the transformations. You only need to deploy one product here and can integrate anything, any technology, any communication paradigm, any API. Reality is that typically you need more than just one component here, because even if your favorite integration piece, like an ETL tool or an ESB, can do all of the integrations itself, you still need additional tools like a message queue for real-time data streaming from, for if you don't do it in a batch mode. And then if you do it at high volume, you might need even another message queue. And then you also need data storage if you want to have replayability of data, if you want to take a look at historical information or simply for high availability for a longer term. In addition to that, you want to correlate data in real time so you add a stream processing engine and so on. So reality is no matter if you're working with different commercial vendors for traditional middleware or with the open source space where you have then things like Apache Camel together with other tools like RabbitMQ, and so on, you still need a lot of different frameworks to glue all together end to end. And this is a huge problem, not just regarding the efforts, but also regarding the end to end SLAs and support for these kind of systems. And it's very clear if the integration middleware is down, everything is down. So it's much more crucial than just one end application. Well, while we talked about MQ, ETL and ESB in the last decades, in the meantime, there is a new thing on the market. It's called IPaaS. IPaaS is an integration platform as a service. And here you see a magic quadrant from Gartner. So they are very famous and showing these kind of products here. And therefore you see there's many of them. There is no clear definition for IPaaS. So some vendors simply take their existing legacy technology and put it into the cloud and sell it as IPaaS. Some others, were created really in the cloud are much more cloud native and elastic and fully managed. So that's better already if you're cloud only. But even then, it's still the same problem Then it's just an integration platform. So this is good for some use cases, right? But it's not really solving all the problems. We will see today why people still use Kafka for many use cases as integration platform. The reason why we need this kind of change is that the world has changed. So here are just a few of the buzzwords. So there's more and more coming to this, right? So I now could update it with data mesh or any other favorite thing you talk about these days. But the point is that you have new requirements for your business and your enterprise architecture. You need deployments at different scale. 
You need to be elastic and agile and scaling up and down too. And you need a different speed of processing. So in many use cases, real-time data beats slow data. For some use cases, it's just better. For some other use cases, it's a mandatory requirement. For example, if you want to implement fraud detection, well, it only makes sense if you really detect the fraud before it happens so that you can prevent it. If you run it in a batch workload at rest in your data lake overnight, well, you still detect it, but it already happened. And so these are the changes in the end that you need to solve. And here's the problem now with the traditional middleware, and this includes IPaaS, so the cloud native middleware. You have very tight coupling, so everything needs to be implemented regarding the integration within the IPaaS or ETL tool. You have limited scale typically. So some cloud native technologies scale a little bit better, but still, as long as they are built on traditional tools like a message queue or um, an API, well, they often don't scale for the need you have. And with Delt, you still get this slew of components like I discussed before, where you combine your IPaaS with other technologies. And with that, let's talk a little bit more about the data streaming platform and how this really changes the game. Well, now you might say, oh, hold on, I'm a data streaming platform, it's yet another black box, right? So um, on the one side, this is actually true, but the good news is, so this is not marketing here, and I will explain the differences in detail. But no worries, I will also explain later that also a data streaming platform is not solving every problem, that's not what I'm saying. But it combines many of the characteristics you have seen before, so that you don't need a slew of different products or technologies or cloud services and can build most of the challenges of an integration scenario with a single platform. But let's step back first. Let's talk a bit more about data streaming and event-driven architectures, event stream processing and so on to clarify what I mean with that. An event is something that happened. This can be a business event, this can be a technical event like a log, this can be anything, right? Here you see a few different examples for business events like a sale or an invoice. It can be anything in any data format like XML or JSON or something proprietary. And well, the point here is that we have seen this before, right? So event-driven architectures are not something new. With that, let's clarify what's the difference between data streaming and these kind of traditional systems, which you might have used already, like message queues, which are event-based for 20, 30 years already now. And also ETL tools have connectors to message queues and also to Kafka and similar data streaming platforms. So what's the difference? With data streaming powered by Apache Kafka, you combine very different requirements and characteristics into one single infrastructure and platform. It's built for any kind of scale in real time. This combination is already very, very powerful. So you can use it for small transactional workloads, but you can also use it for high volumes of log data, sensors, or whatever data you process. So you can, in the end, use it for transactional and analytical workloads. And that's crucial with very different SLAs. Sometimes it's about low latency, sometimes it's about durability. So with Kafka, you also get it in a durable way. So you don't need to add another storage system to that. The storage is built into the data streaming platform. And with that, you can build reliable platforms for your most mission critical workloads. But you can also replay data later, like if you want to ingest it into an analytics platform, or if your data scientist wants to use a Python client to consume data from the past. So the combination of doing real-time messaging at scale, but also storing the data for true durability and decoupling, that's huge and that's very different from existing traditional middleware platforms. A message queue can send data from A to B, but it's not storing it long-term in a durable way so that you can replay it later. And with that, you don't really decouple the different systems. And in addition to all these characteristics, which are already huge, and this is the main reason why Kafka is so successful, Kafka is much more than that. It's also here for doing data integration and data processing. So you can get data via Kafka Connect from different systems and then correlate and process it. And this combination of features is what makes Kafka so powerful. 
So here's how that looks like. And I know this looks like a marketing slide, right? Because you see data streaming like Kafka can do everything. That's not the point here. The point is that, as I just explained, you combine the different characteristics into one platform to solve specific use cases that need all of these requirements. If you still just need to send a few messages from A to B, a messaging platform is perfect for that. If you need to do reporting and business intelligence on historical data, the data warehouse is the way to go. So all these technologies are really complementary and not competitive to each other. This is super important to understand. So most of the deployments I've seen for Kafka, well, they of course use Kafka for some real-time use cases for transactional and analytical workloads. But in parallel to that, they also ingest data into other databases and data lakes for doing reporting, analytics, training analytic models for machine learning, and so on. So this is really more complementary than you might think. But with that, as I just explained, the unique difference from Kafka to other traditional middleware is that it combines real-time messaging at scale, storage for true decoupling and back pressure handling, data integration to any source or sync, and not just cloud native, but also legacy, and also for stream processing, continuous correlation of the data. These four characteristics combined into one platform are what makes Kafka so different from other middleware. And that's why it's so successful. So the secret source really is that you continuously analyze data while it's in flight. In an integration platform, this can be a streaming ETL process, the same you do in your favorite ETL tool. But now you do it in a streaming way while the data is in motion, continuously at any scale. And as I said before, in most cases, real-time data beats slow data. So real-time is better than batch in most use cases. And that's the key point of using data streaming, not just for sending data from A to B, but also for using the data and correlating it with other data sources. And that's the benefit then. So to clarify this once again, if we have a traditional database or now we are talking about a data lake, a data warehouse or cutting edge, a data lake house, right? Like Databricks uses it and Snowflake. Well, the difference is you have the data at rest. You ingest it very often via Kafka, but then you store it in a storage system. That's the passive data then a table. And then you do an active query against that. That's data at rest, and it's great for reporting, it's great for training analytic models, it's great for complex queries, but it's not built for data in motion. This is where event stream processing comes into play with a data streaming platform like Kafka, where the event stream is the active data, continuously flowing data for building stateless and also stateful applications. You can still query that data, that's also important. You can do the same complex queries like you do in a data warehouse. That's not what it was built for. And that's also why it's complementary. But the key with the event stream processing is that most data is processed continuously, which typically adds value to most business applications. And still you can query it. Like if you have a mobile app clicking a button and want to get information from the stream, you can still do that. You, in the end, turn the database inside out So if we take a look at how that looks, first we produce data to the event log. So this is appended only. This is not updated like in a database. It's appended to the log with guaranteed ordering and with timestamps. And then you consume it. And each consumer can consume it like they need. Not every consumer is real time. Some are near real time, like when you index it in Elasticsearch. Some are a batch when you run a workload in Hadoop or in Spark. You can take the data like you need it. That's huge compared to traditional middleware like message queues, where you just push it out everywhere, right? With this, you automatically handle the back pressure because the consumer controls how to get the data. And with this, you get much more robust systems that are much more reliable and scale better because you as a consumer decide how to consume. You don't get more data fed in than you can handle. And on the other side, Kafka is also built for scale from the beginning. It has high availability features like replication and partitioning built in. Some of these concepts are very similar to traditional data lakes, where you do the same at rest. But here you use it for data in motion to be highly reliable. 
And even if things go down, like a broker goes down, a Docker container in Kubernetes goes down, the network is not accessible in a cloud availability zone, that doesn't matter. Kafka is built for business continuity even if things fail, both on the application side and on the server side. And this is really critical for an integration platform because you don't have active passive systems or something like that, like in legacy middleware. It's a continuously distributed system so that you can operate your integration enterprise architecture 24 seven without downtime and without data loss. And as I said, this is not just true for the core server side, but this is also true for the applications. And it doesn't matter what code you use. If you write Java or Python or C++, C Sharp, whatever. Your Kafka applications are also scalable and elastic and highly available. It's also a distributed system and that's built into the Kafka protocol. You don't have to configure this in your way. This is built into the technology. And then, as we mentioned before, with Kafka Connect and Kafka Streams, this is in the end the, the technology is top on, on top, where you do the data integration and data processing. Many people still only know the Kafka core, which is the messaging and storage part. But even the open source Apache Kafka framework is much more than that. Yeah, and then you have other frameworks on top of that, right? Like if you want to be in a Kafka native infrastructure, you leverage KSQL DB. So instead of writing Java code or something else, you just write SQL queries for continuous data processing. But obviously you can also combine Kafka with other technologies like Apache Flink, for example. Then of course you are not in one infrastructure anymore, but have different infrastructures to set up and operate and integrate. And that already gets harder again if you have an end-to-end -end SLA for latency and availability and data loss. So after now we talked a lot about data streaming and the differentiators compared to traditional middleware, let's talk about how these technologies are competing with each other. Because as we've seen in the beginning, both want to be the integration layer in the middle, right? So that's very clear. And from a middleware perspective, you still have very different options. In the meantime, we're talking a lot about iPaaS if you're in the cloud, but still message queues, ETL tools, ESPs are still very relevant for many companies and enterprise architectures. And on the other side, you have data streaming platforms. Well, here, typically you have Apache Kafka, which is used by over 100,000 organizations in the meantime in 2022. You also have some other niche players, but this is clearly the de facto standard. And now you have the spoil for choice between the traditional middleware and between data streaming for your integration layer. So why do we think about it actually? Why not just use the middleware that exists for decades? Remember the world has changed. If your traditional middleware still works for the use cases you need, you don't need to change it. It's very easy. But for many new use cases you build, you need new scale, and or new speed for processing the data and or the efficiency of being agile, of having true decoupling, zero downtime, versioning automatically built in so that you can upgrade just the client without the server and without downtime. All these characteristics are crucial in the modern world. And this is typically where traditional middleware cannot help by combining these characteristics. And therefore, as I said, um, the market has already decided for data streaming. It's very similar to what you know from S3 as an object store. This came up in the last five, six years almost everywhere. It started at Amazon where they now have their object store. This API from Amazon got the de facto standard and most other storage vendors also built their object stores on the S3 API, even though it's a proprietary protocol from Amazon. For Kafka, it's different. Kafka is an open source framework and it's an open protocol. This is super important to become a de facto standard, even better than a proprietary protocol like S3. And for that reason, as you see here, um, because Kafka is so successful, obviously there's many vendors behind that. So you can still use open source Kafka and build your own stuff, but you can leverage plenty of different vendors. Not all of them are really using Kafka. Some are just using the Kafka protocol. 
And then often they don't support it 100%. That's another discussion. Like some people then exclude exactly one semantics or some other features from their implementation. But in the end, the great news is that Kafka became the de facto standard for data streaming and many vendors and cloud services support it under the hood, at least partially for some of them. And now Kafka in the meantime is used everywhere. So I won't talk too much about that, what I did a few years ago. Today, I think you know that Kafka is used everywhere, not just by tech giants, and also not just for big data workloads where it was built for 12 years ago, but also for many transactional workloads. The point is more that with data streaming, you can get business value into many different use cases. From a business perspective to increase revenue or customer experience, to decrease the cost or to mitigate the risk. And based on that, there is a really a broad spectrum of use cases. In our case here, now we're talking about traditional middleware versus Kafka, but very often there is still the backbone for all these use cases. So even if you want to build a business application, you need to integrate data from Salesforce with data from your Oracle database with custom applications. So in the end, everything needs some integration. And therefore, everybody's using it for many different projects. Here's just a few examples from the finance and insurance world. But um, you can just check out past Kafka summits. So um, these events are ongoing every year. And with that, you see a lot of deployments across different use cases in your industry, no matter what industry you're in, I can promise you. Here's an example architecture for data in motion. So here on the left side, you see the traditional things, right? Like a database and a CRM system. You get the data in either with out-of-the-box connectivity using Kafka Connect. That's the same like you know from your ETL tool or iPaaS. You have connectors built on the product or technology. And then on the top right, you see how you also correlate and process the data. For example, with Java, with Kafka Streams, or with SQL, with KSQL DB. Then you're still in the Kafka native ecosystem. One infrastructure end-to-end -end for low latency, high availability, 24-7 support, and so on. Of course, you could also use Apache Flink here, right? To do the end-to-end -end stream processing together with Kafka. That's up to you with the trade-offs about that. And then you can also embed other technologies, like in this example, TensorFlow, where we embed an analytic model into a streaming application. And then parallel to doing the real-time data processing for the use cases where this adds value, you also connect to other data sinks, like a database, a data warehouse, or anything else. So the key difference now to traditional um, data warehouse approaches is that you don't just ingest data via Kafka into the data warehouse or data lake, because then at the bottom right, the data is at rest. This is great for reporting. This is great for BI. This is great for machine learning training. But this is not built for then taking the data in action in real time again. And this is the difference when you use data in motion continuously versus data at rest. Both have their use cases, but only if the heart of the infrastructure is real time and scalable and reliable end to end, then you can use this as a integration middleware. And that's why Kafka shines here in the middle compared to traditional ETL tools and other technologies using here. And it also truly decouples the system. This is super important because not everybody can handle the load coming from the left side. In the case of Salesforce, it might be easy. It's a few REST API calls. If it's a sensor coming from the car, and then you have hundreds of thousands of cars, then that's high volume. And not all consumers are built for that volume. So you might pre-process and pre-aggregate that and handle the back pressure with Kafka before you ingest it into your database or data lake. The other benefit of data streaming is that it's not just one cluster typically. You can deploy that across different environments. And this can be multi-cloud, replicate data in real time from AWS to Google, for example, or to Alibaba in China. You can do hybrid integration scenarios where you deploy a Kafka cluster in your data center and one in the cloud. You can also do migration scenarios where you migrate your existing Kafka cluster into a cloud service. And then from an um, architecture perspective, there's very different deployments for different SLAs and different requirements. One might be mission critical stretched across different regions. Another one might be an aggregation scenario. 
this really depends on your use case and there is plenty of different options here. That's also the great thing about the Kafka ecosystem. You can deploy this like you need. It's not just a very simple architecture like an active passive system that you deploy everywhere for its own use case. This is really connected to each other depending on your use cases and all in real time based on the Kafka protocol. So in summary, why are people using data streaming with Kafka instead of traditional middleware? First of all, it's big changes ahead. So this is a paradigm shift. You need to rethink how you use data. And with that, keep in mind, the data streaming platform is not just a message queue. The core of it is also messaging at scale. It's a different paradigm how you use the API, but it's messaging at any scale. And you can also build things like fire and forget, publish, subscribe, or even request response on top of Kafka. But it works differently than how you do it with a JMS API. That's super important. It's a paradigm shift about the implementation of these design patterns. But you can do that, and that with a single infrastructure. Not just for messaging, but also for storage, for true decoupling and back pressure handling, and for processing the data and correlating the data. And that can be done at any scale. So you can start very small, but then you can scale it up without changing the architecture. If you have a message queue or ETL system, you often need to re-architect or deploy several instances of them. With Kafka, you can process gigabytes per second with a single cluster. And therefore, reliability and zero downtime are crucial in most use cases. And a few characteristics add on to that, like you can't do it with transactional behavior. This once again is very different than from what you know from your mainframe or Oracle database or IBM MQ. It's not the same transaction principle. It's not a two-phase commit because that doesn't scale. But it provides the API to do exactly one semantics, end-to-end -end, from the producer to the consumers. And this is exactly what you need in an integration platform. In a distributed system like Kafka, this works differently, but it works and that's what you care about. You just configure it and turn it on. It also has rolling upgrades and backwards compatibility. This is huge in an integration platform because you cannot update all the applications at the same time and some will maybe never update it. So this is huge compared to other integration platforms. And the other key characteristic is that they will truly decouple the clients. The client can be anything. It can be a Java application. It can be an ETL tool. It can be anything. But they're truly decoupled from each other. With the combination of messaging and storage, Kafka creates the dump pipes and smart endpoints principle. And this is, this is really super important for integration platforms where you integrate many different applications, communication paradigms, and technologies. And obviously with Kafka, you also don't have a vendor login. So even if you choose a vendor, you still can also migrate from one to the other much more easily because Kafka is an open protocol, right? So this, of course, you cannot use all the features then, like what's built on top of that. But like you go from Apache Kafka open source into a cloud service, you can also go from one to the other again because it's all built on the Kafka protocol if you choose the right vendor. And this is very different from traditional middleware. So even if you take a look at an open standard like JMS for message queues, it's super hard to migrate from IBM MQ to another message queue based on JMS. Reality is that this is typically a new project. With Kafka, you can use tools like Open Source Mirror Maker, or in our case, the much better tool Cluster Linking from Confluent, which is built into the API so that you don't need additional resources. But the point is, this is not just used for integration scenarios, but then also for migration scenarios. The other key benefit I want to talk a little bit more about why Kafka instead of traditional middleware is that Kafka is eating its own dog food. This is also what people underestimate. So you might think about, well, should I use my favorite traditional middleware or maybe an iPaaS in the meantime? and combine all these different zoos of technologies, as we explained? Or do you use Kafka? Well, that's exactly the point, right? On the right side, you see Kafka using the characteristics for all of its components. Kafka Core is messaging and storage at any scale. 
But if you use Kafka Connect for data integration, it also uses the Kafka ecosystem for the high availability, for the back pressure handling, for the backwards compatibility. All these things are built into the Kafka protocol and you use that also for data integration. And in the same way for the stream processing components. They are all their own processes running in own containers in a Kubernetes environment, for example. And they scale by themselves, but they are connected to each other. And in the end, the high availability is all relying on the Kafka topic. So it's eating its own dog food for providing high availability, low latency end-to-end -end communication, guaranteed ordering, and all these kind of things. And all of that together with traditional middleware, including iPaaS, you need to combine different platforms to achieve that. And this is then different cloud services, different vendors, different code bases, and so on. So especially in integration where you need to guarantee end-to-end -end flow, ideally in real time reliably, the more components you use, the harder. And that's exactly what Kafka does different. You still have different components, but they all rely on the Kafka protocol to guarantee end-to-end -end availability and SLAs. And this is really a huge game changer for integration middleware. You're still truly decoupled between these applications and you can build your applications like you need. Like one integration implementation might be still an ETL tool that connects to Kafka. So Kafka is a dump broker. It doesn't know about the details. That's outsourced to the client side. This is this smart endpoint dump pipe principle. And this is huge. So you can use different technologies for the integration. If you use iPaaS or any other traditional middleware here, you need to integrate and implement all the integration with the iPaaS or ETL tool. All the business units need to use that tool then. In Kafka, use your own tools and programming languages. And just use the right client and Kafka API from the outside to communicate with the brokers. And this is a very different approach and much more decoupled from each other and provides much more flexibility for everybody. So a clear recommendation, this is a, a great anti-pattern described by ThoughtWorks. Don't use your ESP or MQ knowledge with Kafka. I have seen people trying to do this. This will fail. If you know a message queue or an ESP retail tool and try to re-implement this with Kafka in the same way, then you will fail. Data streaming is a paradigm shift. You handle the data differently. And with that, the APIs are different, the architecture is a bit different, and therefore you implement use cases differently. Just to give one example again, as I said, you can implement things like request reply with Kafka, but it's not the same API or principle like how you implement it with JMS in a message queue system. So just be aware of that and you need to rethink how you implement data streaming. Otherwise, if you try to re-implement a message queue on Kafka, this will fail. That's not how Kafka is built. This is super important to get it right. I mentioned several times that one of the key characteristics of Kafka is the true decoupling. With that, you can build a domain-driven design or what people call it today then, uh, microservices or even further away now, we are calling it data, data mesh. So the point is that you build your own services or applications or data products and they can use their own technology and interface. Because Kafka is not a message queue, like a traditional middleware or just REST APIs you use in an iPaaS, it's really a combination of real-time messaging and true decoupling with the storage. So each of these domains can use their own product and API. Not all need to write code or use direct Kafka tools like Kafka Connect. You can also use your iPaaS or ESB and connect that to Kafka for building a specific integration workflow or business application. So you're very flexible here. If you just use an iPaaS or ESP, you build all the logic with that technology. With Kafka, you're super flexible. So here you see the principle of the dump pipe and smart endpoints. And from a more internal perspective, the other benefit is that Kafka decouples the storage and compute. This is also huge regarding this dumb pipe and smart endpoint. So you do the compute where it makes sense. And even under the hood of Kafka itself with the brokers, you also decouple the storage from the compute using tiered storage, where you offload 
most of the storage into an object store, like AWS S3. That's the same principle you know from modern data lakes in the cloud, like Databricks, for example. The same is done, like you know it from data at rest in a data lake, now also in Kafka. And this is huge for um, having more cost-efficient and scalable integration architectures. The last part I want to tackle here is to be sure that you are cloud native in the future. Cloud native in the end is also another buzzword, but it means that you are more elastic and flexible to scale systems up and down and that you can enhance it without re-architecting the infrastructure. In the cloud, you should evaluate that you really have a fully managed data streaming service. Then you don't have to worry about the elasticity and the scale and important, not just scaling up, but also being able to scale down, which is much harder in a distributed system to implement. If you're in a self-managed environment, like on-premise or at the edge, then you can still be cloud-native. Not serverless, like in a cloud offering, but at least cloud-native with technologies like Kubernetes and containers. So here it's also important that um, the vendor or solution gives you the framework like a Kubernetes operator to do all these things automatically, like rolling upgrades, like handling failover automatically, and all these kind of things that you don't want to care about. This is important to be really cloud native to guarantee business continuity. This is in the traditional middleware world where the iPaaS solutions are much better than a traditional ETL tool or MQ system because that's what you operate by yourself. With iPaaS, it's also fully managed, similarly to a fully managed Kafka service. The important part, and in this case, I'm talking here about the Kafka services, but the same is true for traditional integration platforms like iPaaS and, and ESPs. Be careful when you see the term fully managed or serverless, because many vendors only use it as a marketing term, but actually it's still just provisioning the brokers or servers for you and you have to operate it. Very often you still need to do the performance tuning, you still need to do the high availability guarantees, you still need to do the bug fixes and security issues by yourself. Some vendors even exclude Kafka support from their Kafka cloud offerings and they only guarantee you the infrastructure under the hood to run 99.99. This sounds insane, but that's what it is. So make sure to read the terms and conditions of your Kafka service. If they exclude or limited, have limited Kafka guarantees available. A fully managed service is only fully managed and serverless. If you don't have to worry about scalability, failover, rebalancing, security fixes, version upgrades, performance tuning, and so on. This is super critical when you evaluate software as a service. And that's not just true for Kafka, but in the same way for iPaaS or any other integration solutions. Let's now talk, take a look at a case study. In this case, it's advanced outer parts. So advanced outer parts, well, had a traditional middleware infrastructure, like most enterprises that are older than five or 10 years. In their case, they use a lot of IBM technologies, including event-based technologies like IBM MQ. Their problem was now that the world has changed. So they built a lot of new components like online stores, mobile apps. So remember, like I said before, the world has changed regarding requirements for real-time data processing, scalability, and agility and flexibility. And therefore, such an ecosystem where we have a spaghetti architecture doesn't work and scale anymore. It's not maintainable. It doesn't scale for all use cases. It's super hard to operate. License costs are very high because for every new application, you need to deploy a new IBM MQ deployment, for example. So this is really hard and it doesn't scale for new use cases. So what Advanced Auto Parts did is they migrated, not in a big bang, but in a, in a longer term project, into a data streaming infrastructure. In their case, they also moved to the cloud to have a serverless offering. That's what I just discussed before. In an integration middleware, it's the same like in a business problem. The customer or end user wants to focus on the problems to build, like integration workflows, not on the infrastructure, on the middleware. And this is where data streaming in a serverless way shines. And now you have a truly decoupled, call it microservice architecture or data mesh 
or whatever your buzzword is. But the point is you have now a truly decoupled event hub in real time at scale and can connect your different systems and technology, including legacy and new cloud native applications. Now, you understand now a bit how um, Kafka and traditional middleware compete around several use cases, but in the end, they're also friends. Just to give an example in the beginning, so um, uh, while I work for Confluent, um, a few, few months ago, um, we did a strategic partnership with IBM. So you might, might sound, this sounds strange because IBM is selling tools like IBM MQ and other integration middleware, and that's true. But still, um, as part of their integration middleware cloud pack, they added Confluent as the data streaming standard because it brings so many benefits into that. And still you have the option of choosing the right tool. IBM MQ for messaging, API management tools for REST APIs, or Confluent for data streaming. So it's complementary to each other. It's friends. Find the right tool for the use case. And also, that's also the reason why most middleware technologies today provide Kafka interfaces for producers and consumers. On the one side, this is because, as I said before, Kafka is the de facto standard for data streaming. No question. And on the other side, no matter if it's a modern cloud native iPaaS or a legacy middleware, Without the support for Kafka, it doesn't work anymore because you need that because every organization is using Kafka. But in this way now you can combine traditional middleware for connecting to like legacy applications or specific protocols or doing complex transformation with a great visual coding tool, also with iPaaS then, and also using the benefits of data streaming. This is why they're really complementary and integrate with many different options. This can be connectors directly to Kafka. This can be a message queue connector. This can be just a REST API, whatever makes sense for your tool to connect to Kafka. And also on the other side, and this is also what I want to be very clear on. So while I talked a lot about how great data streaming and Kafka are, it's not an all rounder. It's not the silver bullet for every single problem. If you need to build a synchronous web service, well, today you likely don't use SOAP anymore, but more like REST APIs or maybe gRPC. Well, you should do that with that technology. If you need to integrate with legacy components like COBOL on the mainframe or Edifact for transferring documents and like healthcare, well, the legacy middleware was built for that for 20 years and they typically do these transformations the better way. Unless the interface is also modernized and update to REST APIs or data streaming, you need to use the legacy middleware for that. And as you see here, there's many other things like managed file transfer, real batch processing. That's these things where simply Kafka is not the right technology and you shouldn't use it and try to use it for that. One of the key strengths both of legacy middleware and now also of iPaaS technologies is the visual coding, the drag and drop to doing complex transformations and ETL. This is really where traditional middleware and iPaaS shine and where you should use them and combine them with Kafka. Kafka can still be the data hub in real time at scale. Remember smart endpoints and dump pipes. And now one smart endpoint is this visual coding iPaaS tool where you write an integration workflow and ingest it into Kafka then. On the other side, having said that, there's in the meantime also vendors bringing you visual coding on top of Kafka. Like in this case, you see the Confluence Stream Designer. So there is also technologies that are Kafka native and provide you with the capabilities to do visual coding for building integration pipelines. So not in all cases, you need a third party product for doing that. But again, like always, it has trade-offs, right? Pros and cons. I'm not saying you shouldn't use other iPaaS anymore in combination with Kafka. So last but not least, let's also talk about how Kafka or data streaming and traditional middleware are free enemies, friends and enemies at the same time. Well, first of all, a big bang always fails, especially in integration architectures, right? So this is a project, a long-term project. And on the other side also, some technologies never die, right? If you talk to a big bang today, they still will run many workloads on a mainframe. 
And we are not talking about a few decade old machines. We are talking about C14, C15, or now C16 mainframes with incredible power and RAM and compute. And still COBOL code runs on them, right? So legacy technology will not go away. It's still running and needs to be connected with modern tools. And this is why often legacy technologies can still be used in the middleware space to integrate with that, like with a mainframe. And then you use Kafka for connecting the mainframe via the legacy middleware and combine it with the new cloud native technologies. This is what you see here. So here in this example, the event hub in the middle is scalable in real time and truly decoupled systems. And in the case now where we're working with IBM, on the left side, we also see that we are using IBM MQ for connecting to the mainframe or to other services. And then we leverage the Kafka Connect connector for IBM MQ to connect the dots, to stream data between the mainframe and Kafka in both directions so that you don't need cone changes on the mainframe, but can still offload data from there or send orders from a mobile app on the other side back to the mainframe database. That's also on the right side what you see. So as I mentioned, Kafka is for data streaming. If you need to do API management based on REST APIs, well, for example, at Confluent, we have a REST proxy and the cloud service has REST APIs. So you can also use produce and consume via REST API to Kafka. That's totally okay. And actually this is used a lot in many use cases where it makes sense. And then you can easily put an API management solution, like in this example, IBM API Connect, or maybe something like Mules of any point, right? So we see all of these technologies combined with Kafka because these tools are great for API management and exposing a REST API to the outside world. In the future, this will also change. Like um, with Async API, for example, you can also build a streaming API management on top of Kafka. And this is both where the API management solutions are going, like IBM or Mulesoft, and also the Kafka vendors are going to provide an open interface to Kafka. And still then, even then, for some use cases, you do direct streaming for B2B, sharing streaming data at high volume in real time. For other use cases, like to a mobile app, a REST API might still be the best solution because it's well understood. It's very simple. It's maybe already supported in your system. So even in the future where we see APIs like Async API, this will be complementary to each other. And so how to integrate the old and the new world? I want to conclude this presentation with an example. In most cases, this is an ongoing process where you have old applications and new applications. And with that, old technologies and new technologies. You migrate them over time. Like in this example, we are starting real legacy, a core banking platform from the 70s. This is running with COBOL code and has mission-critical workloads still running today, 50 years later. Well, the first step is often not just re simply replacing it because that's too hard and too risky. So you still keep it running and offload data we are some kind of integration point into the data streaming platform. Remember, the data streaming platform is not just a message queue, it also stores these events. So you can consume it from a mainframe or other legacy technology once and then keep it in the data streaming layer to push it to other applications or to replay it later. This reduces the cost a lot because, for example, for mainframe, you pay for every consumption. And also, it handles the scale because many of these legacy applications are not built for the scale you need. You cannot consume 100 times the same information. That's not how this database was built for. For the integration middleware here, that's also where you are flexible. You can directly integrate from the data streaming platform to the mainframe with things like an IBM MQ connector. Or on the other side, you can use a third-party tool like IIDR from IBM or third-party change data capture or anything else. Or I have even seen customers that just call a REST API from the COBOL code into Kafka. Very flexible how to do this and do the decoupling. And then while the mainframe is still running, you can build new applications around data streaming, either with Kafka native technologies or with other third-party, for example, to build a data lake and still keep the existing systems running and integrated. And then over time, for some of these legacy applications, well, at some point in time, you might decide to replace them 
by new cloud native technologies. That's also an ongoing process. First, you build your new application, you battle test that it's running in production, and then you shut down the mainframe afterwards. And this can happen per application, not for the whole infrastructure at once. And this is in the end the best practice how to do this enterprise architecture for middleware and how you complement existing middleware with modern cloud native data streaming. Last but not least, I also want to mention that, of course, there's also then technologies and products supporting these kind of migrations. Like at Confluent, what we have built as an accelerator is the so-called JMS 2.0 bridge. That's super cool, because with that, if you need to migrate from MQ systems that use JMS, you can keep the JMS code, but instead of writing to your MQ broker, you write to a Kafka cluster, but you still use the JMS API for that. So in the end, you send some, have something like jms.produce message in Java code that's already built 20 years ago. And now you can keep that code in a legacy application, but it's not sent to IBM MQ. It's sent to Kafka instead, even though your code is still the JMS API. And with this, we also can easily support you with migrating existing workloads into the Kafka ecosystem. So this is huge for some use cases for doing these kind of migrations. And this is also the help for doing the migration in a more advanced way than I just showed you before. So why are people now working with Confluent for middleware? Well, the rise of data in motion is clear. I mentioned that it's the de facto standard in the meantime. Over 100 org over 100,000 organizations use Kafka today, and many of them are working with Confluent because Confluent was founded by the inventors of Kafka and created or established to make Kafka enterprise ready and also to provide a complete platform around that and provide it as a serverless offering on all major clouds. And that's in the end what happened today. And the important part here really is we can help you with this journey. It's on the one side about the products, of course, including the, including the connectors, including the migration tools, including the operations and monitoring, or the serverless offerings in the cloud, but also the help and expertise for doing these projects. As I explained in the last slides, this is a journey. And to get it right, you cannot use your ETL or MQ knowledge because data streaming is different. It has very different characteristics as we learned with very different scalability and SLAs and so on. So that's why it works differently. And that's why we help you with this journey, not just from a product, but also from an expertise perspective. And of course, then on top of that 24 seven support end to on end. So, in the end, Confluent completes Apache Kafka. So I typically see Kafka as a car engine. It's battle tested, it's open source, you can use it for free. And many customers actually coming to us are already running Kafka, but it's just a car engine. You need to build your own car around that. Instead, most of our customers want to have a complete car that's safe and secure and provides connectivity and operations tooling and monitoring and so on. That's a complete car you get from us. You can deploy that everywhere, bare metal, in containers, on Kubernetes, in the cloud, across clouds, stretch it even across regions for the most mission critical use cases. We have many options for that complete car. And then in the cloud, you're even more lucky. We provide you the self-driving car level five, truly serverless. That's very different from many other Kafka offerings in the cloud that only provision a cluster for you. I discussed this on one of the last slides before, right? So really evaluate if your Kafka service in the cloud is self-driving, fully managed, or if it's just provisioning the, the, the car to you in this example, and you have to drive it by yourself. Yeah, with that, I hope this was a good overview about how people use data streaming with Kafka for enterprise architectures in the middleware space, and also to understand how it complements existing middleware and where you maybe can replace it. So I hope you have learned something here. Just let me know in the comments or share feedback. Feel free to connect to me on Twitter and LinkedIn to stay in touch for future updates and discussions.